Hello, everybody, and I'd like to welcome you to our latest Outbreak Management Advisory Board. Um, whether you're on the group or you're watching uh, the meeting from home, you're, you're very welcome. First agenda item is just to go through any uh, welcome and apologies. So I'd like to ask uh, Tracy to read through the apologies so they can be recorded in the minutes, please. So we have apologies from Philip Allett. Um, Police, Fire and Crime Commissioner. Apologies from Sean Balsam at Health Watch York. Uh, Mark Victorman from First York Buses. Lucy Brown from Hospital. Phil Metton from the CCG. Stephanie Porter from the CCG. Uh, Sharon Stoltz, the Director of Public Health, and Fiona Phillips is substituting. And Dr. Sy Sally Tyra from the Local Medical Committee. Thank you very much for that, Tracy. And I, and I know just for those watching at home that a few other board members might join us during the meeting. So if uh, people suddenly pop up onto your screens, and um, that's what's happening uh, later in the meeting. So welcome, everybody. Particularly appreciate the time of those that have been able to come here. I know the back of uh, half term and, and other things that have been going on. Um, so we'll move straight through onto the agenda items. Um, agenda item one is any uh, declarations of uh, interest that need to be declared in relation to the agenda. So I'll just give a couple of seconds in case there are any, um, if not, no uh, extra declarations to declare. Thank you very much. Um, and that will take us straight through to agenda item two, um, which is the minutes of the last meeting, which was on the 19th of May. There were a couple of actions um, arising uh, from those minutes. One was about uh, vaccine uh, misinformation and one was uh, about GP surgeries. And both of those items are covered in later uh, agenda items. Um, so um, just now to give a couple of seconds in case anybody wants to raise any issues or matters arising uh, from the minutes. Um, if not, thank you very much. If you don't, if you don't shout now, we'll take that as, a, as signing off the minutes as a correct uh, record. So thank you everybody for that. And um, that takes us straight through to agenda item three, um, which is emergency response hubs. Uh, and we are joined by more escape from the council's communities team, who hopefully now will pop up onto her screen. Welcome more and I'll hand straight over to you. Thank you. I struggled to unmute myself there briefly. Uh, good evening, everybody. So uh, I've come along. Uh, I submitted a, a short report, but just to come along to give an update on the emergency response hubs and the sort of plans going forward and particularly over the summer. So hopefully you had a chance to have a look uh, at the, the short paper. A uh, gratuitous way of, of just uh, making sure that I flagged up the, the fantastic work of the, the volunteers that have been attached to the hubs, gave an outline of how we've been operating uh, across the, the dividing the city into the five hubs and gave a bit of a flavour of the sorts of things that the hubs have been up to, um, tried to keep it brief. Big numbers, I know there are a lot of big numbers across the city in all sorts of ways at the moment, but just having a look at that sort of 20,000 phone calls made, um, 8,000 food supplies, 1,500 prescription collection and deliveries, and I'm sure that's only the tip of the iceberg actually because uh, at certain points things have been quite busy. So maybe um, collating all that information and collecting it hasn't been quite as um, sharp as it might be sometimes, I think. So I think that the, the real point of coming along was to talk about what our plans are going forward. Um, at the moment, the, the demands for support through the hubs that are coming through from a phone line point of view or from an email point of view are very light touch. It, it's particularly those that are having to self-isolate, having tested positive or being a contact. And they are, um, they are very few and far between at the moment. So really our, our main focus has been working with those that we've been working for for a longer time, maybe those that were shielding, and um, supporting them to transition back into some sort of um, normal life, into that recovery phase, if you like, looking at uh, the ways in which that they can um, start to do for themselves again, giving them the confidence in particular to, to start doing some of that stuff. Signposting people to um, specialist services where that's needed, uh, connecting people with the local food projects and initiatives um, 
wider than the ones that we're connected with ourselves. There are a lot of food projects that are, are running out of the same spaces as, as the community, the emergency response hubs. So that, that, that's been fantastic because that partnership has, has worked really well. Um, and we've also started to try and address some of those anxiety issues. So we've had some training and having conversations around um, vaccinations, about testing, about accessing uh, things like that. We've also had conversations with people that are um, struggling in terms of not having had much social contact at all. So that sort of isolation and loneliness. Uh, we've been starting engagement events, things like socially distanced coffee mornings outside uh, of the hubs, um, various activities like that to try and bring people together and give them the confidence to get out and about a bit again, which um, which has gone down really, really well. That you know, I'm just thinking of one person in, in particular who reported the other day. You sort of helped me when I when I couldn't get out, and you brought me food. Then you connected me with with food projects locally, and and now I've come along to a coffee morning, and you've set me up for the rest of the week because I don't feel isolated anymore. So it's that sort of um, approach that we're concentrating on, which is really the the precursor. Um, for rolling out a, a sort of community hub model and getting back to that, that where we were pre-COVID in terms of looking at having those sort of drop down safe spaces where people can interact and find the, find the support that they need locally. Um, I suppose the other thing that I'd, that I'd indicated in that report was just that, you know, if we needed to dial back up, we could do. <laughs> if we needed to find some sort of hybrid model, then we can do. Um, I just wanted to, to, to flag that up with you. And also um, quite, quite briefly to just um, say that the feedback that we've had has been that um, the response hubs have, and working with the response hub from partners, from volunteers, from our own staff, has really led to an enhanced sense of understanding of local communities. But also it's raised a lot of issues for people and brought a lot of um, concerns and anxieties to the fore. And I think there are ways and means that there are a lot of the groups and organizations within the, VC, the voluntary and community sector that we've been working with um, could really uh, support part of that recovery. So I think that explains my report and, and I'm open to questions. Thank you very much, more for the report and just to echo really what you said about the incredible response, particularly from, from volunteers. Um, that, that came forward and <clears throat> the report I think makes clear part of uh, of that and as you say you could probably talk and put an awful lot more um, into that as well so I know that's appreciated and um, I'll open it to any uh, questions and, and comments and um, one, one from me really more is almost finished starts on the point that you just finished on which is the role of the the hub model in actually helping that recovery from the pandemic and how we can keep hold of all of that knowledge and information learned about you know, individuals, families and communities from, from the different hubs um, as we move forward, whether you've got any thoughts on that, whether you'd want to come back to this board in the, in the future once we're a little bit uh, further along as well. And then maybe I'll, I'll bring Alison in on that, in, in that point in, in a second, um, Maura. I, I think that would be absolutely my point to, to come straight to Alison and, and look at that partnership approach in, in, in our future developments. We've got to make the most of what we've learned um, and what people have learned around us, really, that networking, that connectiveness. There's a lot of that that's 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 happened recently and we need to make the most of that and, and really plan together as to how we're going forward and how we uh, can make the most of the facilities and the strengths within our communities. Thank you for that, Alison. So we have actually got a date in the diary, I think, to discuss this, yeah. Maura, so it is part of our plan. So for me, it's looking at what is the role of the council in this and what is the role of the voluntary and community sector um, and where do we sort of come together? So it's, it's sort of, I think they're the conversations we're going to have um, about, you know, what, what should council do? What should communities do for themselves, perhaps with support from the council? So I think it's looking at the whole thing you know, we have lots of other hubs in York that are run by the voluntary sector as well. So it's just looking at the whole lot and seeing how they fit together, I think. Great, thank you very much. I can't see any other um, questions being indicated, but I do think if 
um, we could log this on the forward plan um, to receive a, a future update. Um, and for me, very much on that focus on how we can use the, the knowledge uh, and the good practice in in recovery from the pandemic, uh, and and maybe our, to give to give uh, Alison and Moore a chance to get together and to almost bring back to us what you think that that picture should should look like. I think would be really positive. And um, so thank you, Moore, for your work and your team's work and for coming along. That's that's much appreciated. And um, so we're noting um, that paper and we'll put it on the uh, forward plan as discussed to, to come back in the future. And um, that then takes us on to agenda item four, which is a presentation on the uh, current situation with COVID. And I'll hand straight over to Fiona. Thank you. And so, yes, I think we'll get some slides up onto the screen. Um, so uh, if we go on to the first slide and just, uh, as usual, kind of look at what the data is looking like at the moment. So people will be aware that we have seen a rise in cases in York. So our current rate is 28.5 per 100,000, uh, which is 60 cases over a period of a week. Uh, we are still, though, below the um, regional and England rates and you can see our position in terms of where we are in the Yorkshire and Humber region. Um, so whilst we have seen that increase in cases there are also you know still some positives so if we go on to the next slide and look at our rate in the over 60 population so that has remained low um, in the latest period uh, just three cases in a week um, and again, um, you know, we're, we're lower than the regional and England rates. So what we are seeing in terms of our cases in York is that they are mostly in the 10 to 40 age group. Uh, and the biggest increase in the most recent period has been in that kind of 10 to 19 um, age group. So generally what we're seeing is cases in, in the unvaccinated population, although it is fair to say that we don't get information on vaccine status uh, when we get the details of a positive case. Um, but what we do know is that we've also had no cases in care home residents since the end of February. Uh, and we know that that's a um, group in which the vaccine uptake was, was very high. So I think what we can say is that we are seeing the impact of the uh, vaccination programme. So if we look on the next slide, this just tells us about uh, people going through the NHS 111 with symptoms of COVID. Uh, so we can see that we haven't had an increase really in number of people contacting the NHS who are unwell with COVID. So that's um, remaining low. Uh, on to the uh, next slide. Again, the other real positive is that we aren't seeing an increase um, in people in hospital with COVID. So uh, as of the 1st of June, uh, there was just one person in a general and acute bed in York Hospital with COVID. So um, that, that's another real positive. And then the next slide, uh, the other bit that we also monitor is deaths um, from COVID. So the red line there, we can see um, in the last period, there were no COVID deaths of York residents. And then when we look at deaths from all causes, um, we can see that's the blue line. We can see it's lower than what we'd normally expect at this time of year. So there are no concerns there for us. So if we just go on to the next slide and look at where we are seeing cases and how they're kind of distributed across the various wards in York and um, there's only one ward where we've seen a statistically significant increase in cases in the last week which is Warcliffe and Clifton but as you can see um, you know the numbers were low so the previous period we, there had just been one case in that ward which rose to 10 cases what we can say is that these are not linked um, to outbreaks particular settings the you know a couple of cases here and there in in and we're seeing household transmission and um, still being the the most likely cause of of how of of that spread um, in communities. Um, 
just then looking at the next slide um, around um, obviously lots in the media at the moment around different variants um, so we are getting better data coming through now on um, the various uh, different variants um, and there are more of the variants that are being processed um, in labs that can do all of that sequencing as well so in the most uh, recent um, month looking at that the um, alpha variant is the still the most dominant variant in york although we have seen more of the delta variant so that may well um, catch up and overtake um, the alpha variant but what we're certainly seeing from other areas as well is is that there isn't any indication that it's more serious or that it isn't responding or it or it's not um the vaccine isn't effective against it. We have also had a small number of other variants um, within York as well. So I think we are just going to see that um, over um, coming weeks and months that these variants do pop up. For when we do get these, um, Public Health England does the majority of the follow-up, particularly with the, the more the rarer variants, as it were, uh, where we're kind of trying to still learn about those and find out where they have originated from. Public Health England does most of that follow up, but we do assist um, if they're having any sort of difficulty making contacts with people locally or need any local intelligence. Um, so on the next slide then, just want to give a little bit of an update around testing. Um, so in terms of controlling the virus, our two key actions are really around testing and vaccination. Um, so this is the data on symptom-free testing in York. So generally still a good uptake of people who are doing symptom-free testing. Uh, but we've been doing, since our last meeting, we've been doing some targeted work to ensure that people know that they can access home testing kits and to really just make it as easy as possible um, for people to do that. So basically, we've been taking them out to people's doors and where and where people are to um, hand them out and sort of give that message of the importance of, of symptom-free testing. So uh, on the next slide, just giving a bit of detail about um, what we've been doing. So um, we started on the 19th of May, and um, we've particularly targeted wards with higher 20 to 40 year old population. So the sort of unvaccinated or partially vaccinated population and also the wards where um, vaccination uptake has been lower so our initial uh, target has been Fishergate, Hull Road, Micklegate wards um, we, we started off kind of trying different approaches to see what worked best and um, so we did some door knocking we've been out and about at um, local retail parks and we've also handed out kits at the COVID vaccination um, site particularly for those people who are having their first vaccine just to reiterate that um, you still need to do testing particularly when you've only had one dose and um, so what we have seen is um, that the team who've been out doing this have had a really good response particularly um, probably more so from doing door knocking people are more you know more happy to spend a bit of time having a conversation on the doorstep than when they're out and about shopping for example uh, we've had a lot of people say they didn't know that they could get tests for free and um, so that's been really beneficial to just get that message out there and, and there and then give them the tests so we've had a really good uptake people are happy to take the tests um, and also because we have had that good response and time uh, and people are willing to talk we've actually used that as an opportunity as well to just ask about vaccine and what people's views on vaccines if they've got any questions uh, around vaccines that we can um, help with so um, you know doing some of that myth busting and, and information given on the doorstep as well so on the next slide then um, so as you may remember the all of the symptom free testing that we're doing at the moment is funded until the end of June uh, and that is funded uh, through central government and um, they have now in the last 
couple of weeks started to give more detail about what the national strategy around testing is and what they are likely to fund local authorities to do. So what we do know is that the strategy nationally will focus on underrepresented groups and those that would be disproportionately affected by COVID. And what they're asking local areas to do is to submit their testing plans by the 21st of June. And then what they've said is that there will be standard rate cards for what they will pay local areas, but they haven't produced those as yet. Um, so what we are doing is um, developing our strategy basically on what we've already started doing. Um, but as we find out what the funding looks like, we, we might need to tweak that um, slightly. So um, just on the next slide then, just sort of sets out a little bit about what our plans are. Um, what it basically means is that we won't have the large testing sites that we had when we first started this um, really which was kind of the approach that we had moved to already anyway so sites like our Foxwood and Acom Explore site and um, those smaller sites um, in some of our uh, more deprived um, areas is, is where we, we will keep those open and um, continue to do that but uh, sites like uh, the stadium we'll move away from having those larger sites. We may, may well look for a, a smaller venue in that sort of Clifton or Warcliffe area to cover that population. We'll also keep our St. Williams College city centre um, site as, as that's one of our priorities around um, the retail and hospitality sector and, and helping to keep that open. Um, some of our other local priorities that are coming out um, is that uh, obviously we still have a commitment to work with uh, universities, two universities, uh, and we've sort of had conversations with them around their plans going forward and, and again sort of uh, moving to smaller sites, ensuring that students have got access to home testing kits, but very much kind of, you know, still doing that work in partnership um, with the universities. Uh, and then we will also continue with our outreach works. We think that has been successful and is a way that we can just get into those communities and, and take symptom free testing into those communities. Um, so we'll continue to do that. Uh, also, we have started, um, we've worked with the food banks in York to have an offering uh, so that people collecting food parcels there can collect symptom free test kits as well so we'll continue to do that um, and then we will look to um, work with some of the faith settings particularly the mosques two mosques in York and um, to look at what work we can do with that so that's so what I um, propose if board members are happy is that we would bring back um, that kind of final strategy to the next meeting but I guess there is opportunity if there are things that board members feel we've missed um, and or other groups that they think it's really important for us to work to and we can look to incorporate that into our strategy as well. Um, on the next slide then going on to contact uh, tracing um, so this just shows our data uh, in terms of how many cases of COVID we successfully contact uh, and as you can see uh, we're pretty much nearly at 100% of all cases followed up by our um, local contact tracing team most weeks. They're following up all cases now, have been doing that since the end of March. We were due to start on Monday following up uh, contacts of cases. Uh, we've had to go ahead to do that now. We've been asking for some time. Uh, unfortunately, it got delayed by the national team, um, but we're hoping that that will start uh, from next Monday. The other thing that's coming as part of following up contacts of cases locally is that we will also be part of a national pilot whereby if people are told they're a contact of a case, they have an opportunity to um, test every day for 
seven days and not have to isolate so that's all part of the kind of national work to you know how do we move out of covid and, and live with it and not have to have people constantly in isolation if they've come into contact with the case so uh, i think that's a positive step and will be a way that we kind of contribute to that learning and um, nationally as well uh, and then finally, um, just a few slides around the COVID vaccination. So um, currently just over 70% of the 18 plus population has received a first dose um, and almost half of the 18 plus population have had two doses of the vaccination. So then looking at how uh, on the next slide that breaks down by the various different age groups. So, um, you know, we are now on to offering the vaccine to the 25 plus age group, obviously, um, you know, that they're, they're still being worked through at the moment. So uptake is a little bit lower at the moment. And then I've talked about this uh, before, but just kind of want to go back to look at how uptake breaks down by the various wards across York. So if we move on to the next slide, um, and what I've done is on the top graph, that's what the data looks like now. Um, so you can see in Guildhall wall, for example, which has the lowest uptake is 75.9% uptake. When I presented this information to you at the previous meeting, Guildhall Ward was 74.2. So we are seeing some slight increases. We know we've been, we've been doing a lot of work with our contact traces, uh, following up people who haven't taken up the vaccine, trying to understand why. And in the comms update later, we're going to give a bit more detail about that. But I think the point I'm making is we are making some progress but it is slow. The, the uptake rates in those wards where it's low isn't massively changing. So there is still there is still work to do there. And then on the last slide, um, just wanted to show, haven't shown this data before, but this is the uptake um, by uh, sex. So we can see that uh, uptake is higher in females than males. So there's more work to do um, with the male population but also uh, uptake by ethnic minority group as well. And um, again, it kind of stands out that in some of our BME groups, the uptake is lower, which um, you know, we know that's been reported nationally, but it is something that we do need to focus on in York and understand why and, and what the barriers are and do more to um, increase vaccination uptake in that group as well. Uh, and that's everything. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, um, Fiona. Just two, two, two questions from me, and then I'll open it to, to any questions or comments from anybody else. Um, you, you touched on at the end there that we're getting more information about um, uptake and, and vaccine inequalities in the communications report, which is next. So don't want to, to go through this too much. But I also think we've got uh, an item on our July uh, agenda to receive a more detailed update. And I think it would be good, like we've discussed in the past, for that update to both include you know, actions that have been done to date, uh, but then actually moving forward, given that we're beginning to see a little bit more data um, you know, specific actions mo moving forward uh, by group and, and by ward. So just to, to, to get any views from you on on that and what we can see in, in July. Um, and then the second question, um, information on, on variants is, is, is very interesting um, and just um, how that information is going to be released either weekly or monthly um, to, to, to give people a, a sense of, of, of what is happening, uh, please. Yeah, so um, in terms of the vaccination, what um, we'll cover a little bit in the comms later is, is, is some of what we're hearing from the contact tracers who are doing those calls as to the reasons why um, people haven't gone for the vaccine. Um, but I, but yes, I think what we need at the next meeting in July is, like you say, more of the actions, what is actually being done and um, 
there have been conversations about a city centre vaccination offer but as far as I'm aware that's um, you know that's a conversation but no, no action has happened in terms of any vaccinations being delivered there so um, yes I think it would be really good to have that um, information about those actions um, that are being taken from Nimbus. Um, in terms of the variants, so we get the data on variants identified fairly um, live, as it were, as as they as they're noted. Uh, so what we tend to get is that we get that it's provisionally um, a variant of concern, but then it takes a bit of time for the full sequencing to be done. So there is a little bit of a delay as to when. It takes about another week before that's confirmed as a variant or not. So, so we're monitoring that on a daily basis. Um, and then, as I said, for those variants that are, you know, more of concern, so the kind of rarer ones, um, they tend to lead to a, you know, a conversation with PHE, and you know, we'll get a bit more detail on those, and there's a bit more work uh, to be done around, kind of working out. You know, is this someone who's travelled abroad, or is there potentially transmission in in your local area of that variant? Thank you very much for that, which I know is is a topic I'm sure we'll pick up in the in the next item as as mentioned. So, um, if we could uh, note um, Fiona's report, please, and I know that the the pack will get attached uh, to the minutes of the meeting. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, which then takes us on to agenda item five, which is the, the communications um, update. Just wanted to first record our thanks to, to Claire uh, Fole, who has moved on to a new new job at the council um, for, for the presentation of the various uh, comms updates over, over time, uh, and to welcome uh, Gareth and Andrew, um, who are therefore here today to, to present the uh, communications update. So I'll hand straight over to you both. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor. Yeah, so I'll, I'll be filling Claire's shoes as the Council's Head of Comms and therefore the representative on this board for, for the next few months. I've also got Andrew Harrison with us, who's been the comms lead on our public health work throughout the pandemic to date. Um, there are some slides with this. Are they appearing? Excellent. Cheers. So the first few slides will be familiar from, from previous uh, previous presentations. Uh, these are the key messages that we're working with at the moment. Uh, we're ready to respond to any changes to these messages after Monday's announcement from the Prime Minister. So we move on. Um, this... Um, this, this slide shows the um, shows the phased approach. We we continue to be in uh, the phase four, the safely recover phase. We just want to move on. Um, and this um, it shows at stage four uh, down the bottom there. Um, it shows shows that uh, it draws on the, the same comms approach that's been successful in phases one and two. So uh, the key is um, accurate and timely information consistently shared by ourselves and partners. Uh, and using insight through regular surveys and partner meetings, which have informed our messages and campaigns. Do you want to move on again? This is the road uh, roadmaps work plan that reflects the enormous amount of work done over the, over the past few months by colleagues and partners, uh, but uh, it won't stop at the end of the June, <laughs> even though that work plan does. Um, we'll update after next week's announcement just to reflect the next phases of comms uh, to support York residents and businesses. It'll incorporate a lot of that insight and data that Maura and Fiona have, have shared, uh, but we know it will focus on normalizing testing, supporting that testing strategy, uh, we're up in vaccination rates, uh, mental health, and uh, they'll all definitely continue as campaign themes, uh, and as well as the campaign that we're going to launch, which will um, get people out and active again um, as, as restrictions are eased. Um, can we next one? Yep, thanks. Um, this is the government's published roadmap. We don't need to dwell on that. Can we move on? Thanks. Um, and again. So this is the... Um, this is the, uh, the accurate and timely messaging. I'm just sharing this. Uh, it just continues a trend that uh, was reported by uh, the, last, the last board by Claire. So lots of COVID-related information to communicate, uh, maintaining the focus on testing, vaccinations, safety measures on bus buses and so on, uh, but an increasing proportion of business as usual communications. Um, what's really important is the, the focus on the future-facing conversations we've started with residents over 
over the city centre, over new public spaces at the um, Castle Gateway, and we'll shortly be launching the citywide conversation to inform three of the strategies which will define um, define much of the future of York. Uh, so how we move around, uh, what our economy looks like, and how we achieve carbon neutral targets. Um, I mentioned these not just to not just to plug our work, but because COVID and our response has changed so much of the landscapes for these strategies. So a large part of this work is is understanding how residents' uh, needs and attitudes have changed as a result of the pandemic. Do you want to move on? Okay, um, now our um, rhythm, the, the rhythm of our communications, we have tweaked it slightly uh, to reduce the frequency of the updates um, as restrictions have lifted. Um, many briefings now once a week, but we're, we're ready to, um, to uh, increase those. Um, uh, if, if needs change. And uh, we're also continuing to see a, a, a small but uh, but positive increase in the number of people signing up to our residents' um, newsletters and other partner newsletters. These are shared extensively by, by partners. Um, and we're also grateful there's, there's quite a lot of residents who um, by their nature just want to be helpful to their communities. So we're regularly seeing the, the updates shared um, through online communities like Nextdoor and Facebook community groups. Uh, the next Facebook Live is scheduled just after the um, just after the uh, announcement we're expecting on Monday. Um, that'll be on the 17th, so that'll be a good opportunity to answer any residents' questions following that announcement. Can we go on again? Okay, this is just the um, uh, the roadmap again. We'll. we'll um, continue that rhythm uh, that we've we used for the last few steps that, that, that's worked so effectively updating media residents, partners, businesses and families. Um, but we're also exploring a few other options, uh, some which are listed here, uh, depending what's announced by the Prime Minister on, on, on Monday. I'd say we're scenario planning, but we, um, we, we don't know what's going to be announced. So we'll react to that. Okay, I'll now just hand over to Andrew to run through some of the detail of, uh, of the rest of the work. Andrew. So uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you. Um, so here's a run through of some of the work we've done in the past few months. As Gareth mentioned, um, we moved to step three. Um, we saw more of the city reopen and um, some of the things we've missed return, um, including things like uh, spectators returning to sporting events and the ability to see people inside. So a lot of the work and there's lots of examples here. Um, has been on trying to help people take the next step safely using um, all the channels available to us. So um, how to travel safely to match days, helping businesses with posters and stickers, and also things like practical tips. So as, uh, as we've got in the bottom left there, so if, if you are seeing friends or when the weather was bad inside, some of the practical things you can do to keep each other safe, um, the rule of six or two households, opening up windows, so continuing to uh, promote those key behaviours and support residents, businesses to take that next step safely. Um, next slide, please. So here's a few more examples of things that came from the last announcement. So uh, this, this, you can see the support for businesses and there's a lovely screenshot of the Visit York advert um, that's um, out there at the minute, but in that has a lot of the key public health behaviors. You can see um, a lovely example of someone wearing a face cover in there. And Gareth mentioned the Facebook Live Q&A that we've got for the next step, but we did one in between the Prime Minister's announcement for step three and the actions coming into place, or the new measures coming into force to answer questions businesses and residents have. And it also helps us collect insight into work that we might need to do. And we supported schools as well as the face coverings guidance change changed. Um, and the, the focus of our comms is, is helping people understand what they can do and take the next step safely. Um, really appreciate and know that people are wanting to do the right thing. So, um, yeah, big focus on that, as, as you can see in the example bottom left. Next slide, please. So uh, a few more examples. So hopefully... Um, uh, many of you will have received the latest Our City, um, which is landed on doorsteps, was sent in May. Um, public health perspective, um, we placed the focus on talking about testing um, and explaining all the options available and how people can access free tests. And we also put in some information on vaccines, answering some of the um, frequently asked questions we get, uh, work closely with the NHS and some practical 
um, advice on how um, people can access vaccination centres, um, how the process works and um, questions around the safety and efficacy to, uh, to build that confidence. And also talking a lot about testing. So um, Fiona spoke a lot about the uh, fantastic work the public health team are doing to um, reach out into communities. So um, we've been updating on where the team are going and how, how it's working. Uh, really good to hear the feedback's um, been really good and it's been well received. And we also um, opened St Williams College, um, open to visitors um, and residents and uh, people who are working in nearby establishments. Um, that got lots of good local media pickups, thank you, so I had, including Look North and Calendar visiting um, about that. And we continue to share the messaging about testing um, as a really helpful way um, to keep people safe. Next slide, please. And a bit more on vaccination. So uh, continuing to support the vaccination rollout. Um, here's a few examples of the NHS messaging. We've been amplifying some at a local level about the vaccination centre and um, some of the other updates around um, women who are breastfeeding, um, the safety of the vaccine and the take up. Um, and the focus is on providing that clear factual information and a couple of um, things which I think have been discussed at the board previously and is at the top there. A letter has gone to all employers asking for their help in supporting uh, their employees to get the vaccine when they're eligible. Um, that came from Sharon and uh, colleagues in the NHS at the CCG in the hospital. So we're hoping we'll help. Um, and really thanking businesses for all they're doing um, to help keep people safe. And um, we're also sharing a new easy read and translated and braille assets with um, partners and stakeholders in the city. Um, so people can find information in an accessible a way that's easy to understand for them. Um, and we'll continue to look at how we can get that out to um, the people we need to. Um, next slide, please. Um, so one of the other things that cropped up at the last meeting was um, anti-vaccine uh, or lockdown sentiments that have been, um, uh, we've been advised of in some areas of the city. Um, so we've circled there a few of the ones that we've been made aware of. Um, we are trying to establish if there are more areas, um, so this works ongoing. Um, we've also reached out to the Cabinet Office for their advice. Uh, they've got misinformation units and are tracking um, this type of um, work across the country. Their advice has been so far that there's low engagement with this type of um, information. It's other factors that... Um, influencing vaccine take-up rates. Um, I think Fiona shared a, a bit of the data through. The initial um, uh, messages that are coming through from the team on the ground who are speaking to those yet to take the vaccine are more of the practical measures, um, such as transport and access and childcare. So, um, but we are continuing to keep a close eye on that to see if there's any barriers that we can address through our communications. Um, next slide, please. And I think this slide um, was kindly provided by Public Health, um, so Fiona might want to add more. Um, it just gives a run through of some of the one-to-one uh, -one support that's been offered in the city um, to try and support residents and have that conversation um, with them. And um, that insight will help to shape our comms as well. Um, so continuing um, to monitor that and um, the data that Fiona shared about certain groups and areas, we're gonna look into that and what we can do to help communities. Um, next slide, please. Um, and then another thing we're continuing to do, as Gareth mentioned, is emotional health. So May saw us have a mental health awareness week. And here's just a few examples of the work that we did in the week and across the month, uh, signposting people to support events, but also offering practical tips. Um, this year, the theme was nature. 
So um, lots of advice on the benefits of um, getting outside for physical and mental health, but things that um, people can do um, to help their mental health, but also keeping that focus on how we can all help each other, um, given it, it's a difficult time and um, just really support each other. Next slide, please. Um, and next slide. Um, so lastly, from us, we wanted to provide an update on uh, the behavioural work and the insight we're gathering. Um, I think this is the slide that Claire took um, to the last update board with the amended plan. So if you go to the next slide, and please, and we could probably update on where we're at. So um, as I mentioned, our city had a survey um, with... Um, well, we put a survey in our city, so we're going to be collating feedback from that as it comes in um, and it'll help shape our communications in the coming weeks and months. Um, a lot about how people are thinking changed as restrictions have lifted. Um, and there's also the Public Health England focus groups that have taken place. So they've started to share their initial feedback with us. Um, so we'll... Um, we're working through that and we'll work through the, the analysis of the resident, um, our city feedback as well. And we'll be bringing that feedback and some proposals to a future meeting um, and looking to engage with people for the next steps you want to take as um, we hope the, or want the city to recover and reopen safely. So um, that's it from us. Um, yeah, any questions? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Andrew and Gareth. And now I'll open it to questions and comments and go to Councillor Runciman in, in, in a second. Um, I won't repeat the questions that I just discussed with uh, Fiona on sort of vaccine inequalities. And I know we'll get that more detailed re report next uh, month. Um, only thing I will ask about is there was the reference to the sort of misinformation that was circulated, but also the, the stickers. And I know that they're not just in the city centre, but they're in some of the outer um, villages as as, as well. Uh, and it might just be a request for you to pass through to our enforcement and environment teams to, to get rid of those uh, with, with partners in the city centre as soon as, as as possible, but whether there's anything you want to reflect on that, and if you could pass that request through through me and on behalf of this board, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah, that, that would be great. And I think, yeah, we're going to do a lot of work trying to establish where they're popping up and keep a real keen eye on it um just help us understand what it's going and yeah look at that removal of our frontline teams great thank you very much councillor Runciman. thank you chair um just to on the same subject to say uh, i agree with andrew that i don't think there's a link between the stickers and the take up uh haxby and wiggington ward is covered with the stickers anti-lockdown anti-vax and it's the second highest take up in the city. So I think that uh, to link the take up with the stickers is actually erroneous, but obviously we need to keep collecting the data. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. I um, can't see any other uh, questions at this stage. So thank you, Gareth and Andrew, uh, for your presentation. And we'll see you again, either both or, or Gareth at future meetings. So thank you very much for that. Um, that then takes us um, straight on to agenda item uh, six, um, which is the update from uh, the universities and higher education uh, subgroup uh, and over to Charlie. Thank you, Keith. Um, I've got very little to add to the written report. Um, we are, of course, uh, looking ahead to what will happen on the 21st of June, as I'm sure we all are. Um, but we're not expecting any university specific guidance to be issued until late June at the earliest. And I, I guess if stage four gets delayed, then that specific uh, advice may well also be delayed. Um, we are very pleased that the vaccination programme continues to go well. And now that it's in that 25 to 29 age group, um, it begins to capture significant numbers, although, although not yet the main bulk uh, of students. Uh, we're working uh, very closely with Nimbus Care, and uh, I'm very pleased to confirm that a pop-up vaccine site will be in operation by appointment only uh, on the University of York campus uh, on Monday next week as a kind of test run. 
uh, and assuming that works well, um, there will be um, a, a greater volume of appointments available uh, the week after, and especially if uh, by that time we've moved down to the 18 plus group. Um, then that's the end of our term, so there won't be anything significant after that. But I, I think we, we can now be quite confident that students in one way or another, somewhere or other, uh, will get their first jab in the next few weeks, probably ahead of the end of July uh, deadline. Um, and uh, we will have that experience of <clears throat> hosting a, a vaccine site from, from next week and the week after. Uh, so we'll be ready to deliver second jabs, most likely on student return uh, in September, and perhaps first jabs for arriving international students who've not had uh, the opportunity. Uh, I think that's very positive. Um, it gives us um, uh, grounds for optimism that we will have a more normal experience uh, in the next academic year uh, than we have had uh, in this one. Um, fingers crossed anyway. Uh, that, that's all uh, I wanted to say, Keith. Thank you very much uh, for that, Charlie. Uh, again, we'll leave a couple of seconds in case any questions or comments, but, but similar to Fiona and, and Moore's team, I know the board would like to say thank you to you and your colleagues at, at universities and colleges for, for all of those efforts towards the end of term. And as you say, in, in uh, September and October and the start of the next uh, yeah. term. So thank you very much for that. Um, so if we note that um, update report, and that takes us um, on to agenda item uh, seven, um, which is a, an information report on the recommendations that came out of the LGA uh, peer review um, of our outbreak management plan. So my understanding is it's <clears throat> mostly here for information, but obviously if you've got any uh, questions, um, and I'll just go to Fiona in case she, she had anything to add at the start. Um, yeah, no, didn't really have anything to add. It was just to really uh, reassure board members that the recommendations that came out of the peer review, we, we are, you know, we haven't forgotten those. We are, we are taking forward work. So um, it's, yeah, for that reassurance, really. But if anyone has got any questions about any of those, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll give a couple of seconds in case there are any questions and comments. And it, it, it seems to me actually that in 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 a sense, the main um, outcome area that either hasn't been worked on or, or has already been completed is that area that we've discussed in terms of ensuring that we were re reaching out to all relevant uh, communities. Um, and obviously that's something that we're going to get that uh, report back on uh, next uh, month, um, which we could obviously record as an action com coming out of that uh, progress report as well. Um, so without any other questions, um, thank you Fiona for that and we'll obviously note um, that update for today. Um, that then takes us on to agenda item um, eight, um, which is items for future agendas. And, and as per previous meetings, if any board members have any items they'd like included, um, just get in touch uh, with Tracy Wallace uh, before the next meeting. We do have for the July meeting um, quite a few items and we've got our standard items on the current situation on communications and from universities and, and higher education. But we've already agreed um, that there'll be an update report on access to vaccines and vaccine inequality. And there'll be a, a report on scenario planning for COVID, particularly looking at, at recovery in the next six to nine months. And there'll also be that more detailed uh, report that Fiona mentioned on the new testing uh, strategy. Um, but if there are additional agenda items to those, please uh, get in touch. Um, and then agenda item uh, nine is dates for future meetings. Hopefully you've had the uh, invites and they'll be showing on the system for residents. Um, but the next uh, couple of meetings are the 7th of July and the 29th of uh, September uh, and others will be listed on the system uh, for information. And um, item 10, any other business? I've not been uh, notified of any. So I'll just uh, check with uh, Tracy uh, that I haven't missed anything that I've been told to pick up today. No, I haven't had any other items mentioned. 
Great. Thank you very much. So just a, a final thank you uh, from me to you all for coming. And I look forward to seeing you uh, in July. Thanks all. Bye bye. There we go. The webcast is